everyone, this is Tim Fox, and I'm here to talk to you about Analytics Zoo today. And we're going to be discussing Analytics Zoo's um, integration with Apache Spark's ML Lib, also known as Spark ML, uh, and its data frame pipelines. So this is actually one of uh, the most exciting features of Analytics Zoo. And let me tell you why. It's because Spark has developed a very rich um, ecosystem around the MLlib functionality. In fact, that's one of the Spark uh, ML uh, functionality is one of the uh, reasons why Apache Spark became so popular in the first place. And it has a lot of very useful utilities and the fact that we have the ability to work with Spark data frames and uh, to uh, perform machine learning within the broader context of the Spark data frame data set APIs um, especially by using a pipeline approach is very cool. So um, we're going to talk about how Analytics Zoo fits into that. Um, so uh, let's go ahead now and look at a Jupyter Notebook that I prepared for us. Here it is. So the title of Jupyter Notebook is called Spark Data Frames and ML Pipeline in Analytics Zoo. So, um, so we're going to go ahead and demonstrate this here. So. Uh, now, I'm going to show you a simple data set that we're going to be loading into a Spark data frame. So this data set is actually known as the heart or cardiac data set, is, being, is a data set in which um, we have some uh, data from uh, a number of patients and some of their uh, very, some, some features there that are related to their health. So we have the age, the sex of the patient, and you can see here we have some other features, most of which these are, uh, you know, kind of re readings, kind of in this medical context, right? So the idea here is is that uh, we have an outcome variable, which is the target variable. So that outcome variable is defining uh, whether or not the person in the question has heart disease or not. Um, so, uh, so that's so presumably. Um, by looking at these things like the age, the sex, the blood pressure, you know, these other kinds of um, uh, cardiac uh, readings, we should be able to help predict whether the person has that uh, disease or not. So that's what we're doing. So in machine learning terms, what we're looking at here is we're looking at a binary classification problem, right? So we know the binary because there's two classes. There's either the person has heart disease or the, the person doesn't. And so, um, so that's what we have here. So now we're going to be um, uh, we're going to be uh, in, uh, initializing um, Analytics Zoo. Uh, so we're going to do that using the init nn context. Um, now, uh, when we uh, run this, you can see here that we have our uh, Spark UI, which is running on our local host 4040, or whatever host you happen to be running on, if not local host, right? So now, the, so that the Spark UI is worth uh, paying attention to. So let's just go ahead and look at what that is. So if I go ahead and click on this, you can see it opens up a new tab in my browser. And you see I have the Apache Spark uh, UI, along with some prior jobs that I've run in previous sessions. So you can see some jobs I have here. Now, once we start running uh, our, uh, Apache, our Apache Spark jobs with Analytics Zoo, we're going to clearly see a whole bunch of new jobs show up, and we'll be get we'll be able to take a look at that. Okay. Okay. So we did that. Now let's go ahead and um, explore the data set a little bit. So first of all, we should go and uh, download the data. So. Uh, I have a link here for that data that we can download, and we've done so. Now let's go ahead and load that into a Spark data frame. Now so far what we're doing here um, is simply just Spark. We're loading the data into a Spark data frame, um, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, show what we've done. Okay, so you see that we have 303 uh, records, we see here that we have uh, the variables that we were talking about, and we also see the data frame as we have it. Now, um, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what we have. So uh, this data frame 
is similar to a pandas data frame. I know many of you are probably familiar with pandas data frames. It's not the same as a pandas data frame. Uh, one obvious difference is it actually prints differently than a pandas data frame. But the most important difference is the fact that a pandas data frame has to be operated on entirely in memory. Whereas a Spark data frame is distributed across a cluster. And so given enough cluster resources, we could in theory be able to process a data frame of any size um, going up to you know big data uh, uh, types of uh, sizes, you know, terabytes, petabytes. So that is one of the advantages of the Apache Spark framework. And so the fact that it, the Analytics Zoo is able to integrate with that framework is really cool. So, all right. So let's uh, now go ahead and do a little bit of data exploration here. Okay. So we've done the describe function. Now we'll note that the describe function we're doing here is called in Spark. Um, now we've converted it to pandas just to help kind of pretty print that here for Jupyter Notebook. Um, so you can see here, for example, that we can see the mean uh, and standard deviation value. So for example, the uh, mean value of the uh, patients here is 55 years or so, 55 years old. Uh, and the standard deviation, that's about nine years. So that kind of shows you uh, where we are in terms of the distribution of, of that. And you can see the other variables here. So if uh, probably, um, you know, if we were going to be doing some data science work, looking at kind of a statistical summary of this variables, that could be really important. Let's also look at the way that um, we break down by our target variable. Now, um, it's really a good idea to do this because a lot of times the target variables um, are not uh, balanced. And the same is true here. So let's actually go ahead and look at a graph of that. Okay, so now remember in this target variable, one means the person has the condition and zero means the person does not have the condition. Um, so uh, what we're seeing here is, is that um, the uh, number of people that have the condition is much smaller than those who don't have the condition. So this is true in lots and lots and lots of data sets. Very common for this to happen. Um, and especially in medical data sets like this, because when we do a, a diagnostic in medicine, uh, most people don't have the condition, right? So, you know, doctors order a, uh, a, a diagnostic and what they, you know, they're trying to do is they're trying to rule out whether or not the person has the condition or not. So usually, you know, most people are, are don't have the condition, which is good. We, we you know, of course, uh, disease, it's a good thing that uh, diseases affect a minority of patients, right? But it also means that uh, in terms of machine learning perspective, we see fewer of the people who actually have the condition than people that don't. Now, in this case, the um, class imbalance is not severe. So we, but it bears looking in mind. If we notice that our, our uh, performance is better uh, related to people who are negative to the condition than people who are positive, then that is something that we want to take into account. We may want to try to balance the data set better. So let's just keep that in mind as we move forward. Okay. Now uh, let's go ahead and we'll create our feature vectors. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead. So now we're, we're going to, um, first of all, we're going to convert our categorical columns. So our categorical columns, we are normally going to use a uh, either a one hot encoder class within uh, Spark ML lib or a string indexer class. So string indexer basically is just going to assign an index to the string. For our purposes, let's just let's just go ahead and do that. So the categorical variable in question is called uh, THAL, and um, it is uh, some kind of a medical diagnostic tool. You know, so point is is that it being um, this is it, fixed, normal, or reversible. So it being a categorical variable, we're going to have to assign a number to it. Um, and let's, so we went ahead and did that. Okay, so let's take our columns of interest. Um, so we, uh, now we are looking at the uh, age, the sex, the T-REST BPS, and these other variables that we have. I think this is cholesterol, right? So 
Here are our feature columns, and we're also selecting our target columns. So now let's go ahead and select the data that we want to do. Okay, so here is the data set that we have. Notice we've removed a few variables looking at just the, this, this set of variables. Okay, and we're going to convert everything to double. Uh, some things are ints here, but uh, we'll just go ahead and convert everything to double. So you see here, everything is double now. Okay, so now it's time for us to uh, create our feature vector. So the feature vector, uh, we're going to be using a class in Apache Spark ML, which is vector assembler. So what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to take uh, our features uh, from a list of columns in the data frame, and we're going to create a new column which has our vector in it. Um, so that new column, in this case, we're going to call it assembled. That's the new column. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so this is it. So you can see here that we've taken our features and we put them here into a assembled, uh, assembled uh, vector. All right. Okay, so notice the magnitude of these different features, right? So some of them are in the hundreds. Others are closer to zero. So those variant magnitudes might be a problem. So let's go ahead and use a standard scalar class within Apache Spark ML Lib to go ahead and standardize that. It's just, this is a step that sometimes, it, sometimes it, it, it helps, sometimes it doesn't, but it usually doesn't hurt. So let's go ahead and, and, and do that. All right, so now um, we've gotten our feature vector and what this has affected are features. So these new set of features here, these are uh, now the scaled versions of the features. Okay, so let's go ahead now and take a look at our data. So, all right, so here's our data. These are the new features that we have. Uh, it's truncating that, but you can see it has, has it, there shows a vector with all of the uh, features, right? And so, um, so now we now notice here how the pipeline API works. We've got we still have all of our original data. We could drop it now if we wanted to, but. We have a column now called assembled. That's the uh, assembled vector. Now we have a column called features. This is the uh, scaled versions of those. Okay, so we're going to split within training and validation. We're gonna do this with just a simple partition rather than something like a, um, a cross validation. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll just do that. Okay, so you can see here that we have uh, 227 uh, count in our training and 76 in our validation. So let's now define our network. So we're going to use a simple feedforward multi-layer perceptron neural network. So this is kind of, kind of a classical neural network. Uh, we're not using any kind, it's not really deep learning uh, in this case, but it is using a neural network. And we are, uh, we have a, so we have four layers total. We have an input layer, which uh, is going to be sized by the number of features that we have. Uh, we also have a hidden layer, which we're going to specify as part of the model. We also have another hidden layer, which we're going to specify. And we have an output layer. And since it's a binary classification problem, the output layer is going to be sized according to the number of output classes that we're going to try to classify, in this case, two. Okay. So we're also going to set some of our parameters here, our hyperparameters. So uh, the um, learning rate we're setting uh, here. Uh, now we could tweak that if we wanted to. We're going to run for 100 epochs. Uh, we're also going to need to specify the batch size. So um, it's usually good to set uh, a batch size as a power of 2. Uh, so we'll set 16 there. Remember, we have uh, about 227 inputs. So by choosing a batch size of 16, that enables us to go through and run at least a few batches here. The data set is very small, but um, we'll go ahead and do that now. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and set these for our network. So now we're going to be using the um, Analytic Zoo Keras, API, Keras style API. So um, notice here that we are defining our layers here. Now we have our input our first hidden, our second hidden, and our output. So um, 
let's go ahead and uh, look at this. Now, um, the input is actually, although it's part of our network, um, it's kind of implied here, right? So because we're going from our input to our first hidden layer, and we're going to use a Keras style dense layer for that because this is a feed forward, fully connected layer. Um, now we'll also have a second hidden layer here. Um, so that's going to have uh, our number of hidden layers. So notice that the nice thing about the Keras API is that it knows that we're doing a sequential container, right? So that just means sequential container just means that um, we are uh, plugging the output of one layer directly into the input of the next. Um, so uh, so that's a, uh, that works out well for this case. And so we don't have to do any bookkeeping as far as the number of neurons and all that because um, it knows that all the outputs of the input go into the first hidden, all the outputs of the first hidden go into the second hidden, and then the outputs of the second hidden are going to then go into our final output layer, which is going to be also known as our softmax layer. And the reason why we call it softmax layer is because the activation function here, of course, is softmax. That's because we are um, using softmax as uh, our output. So remember what softmax is. Softmax is going to be giving us a probability of each class as it's going to be, right? So, um, so all right, so that's, that's what we're going to be doing here. Now let's go ahead and um, uh, go ahead and we're going to uh, integrate this into our Spark ML, MLlib pipeline. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So um, as you can see here, we're using the NN classifier class. So this is, of course, a classification problem. And so within Analytic Zoo, we have the NN classifier. Uh, so we're going to go and pass that in. We're also going to um, uh, use, that's going to be our estimator. So we're just going to set the number of epochs, which I believe was 100. we are set our batch size, which I think was 16. We're going to set our learning rate, which was 0 0.001, I believe. And then uh, we'll go and, and run that. So basically, we're going to run through training, right? And so now um, Analytic Zoo is going to be doing the training for us. So let's go ahead now and start training. So this should take uh, about 30 seconds or so, depending on you know your cluster resources. So let's just go ahead and give that a try. Okay, so actually, we set this up. Now we're going to actually go and run the train. All right. Now, since I'm running that, let's go now and look at our uh, PySpark shell here. Okay, so you can see I have an active job here. So let's go ahead and look at that. Uh, so it looks like it is, in fact, um, here is our job, right? So you can see here, how long did this job take? So not very long, actually. It ended up being finished after about a millisecond. So let's go ahead and back to our jobs and see what we have. Okay, so you see actually it's generated several jobs here. Here we have, and it looks like we're in fact all done. So, um, so when we ran this here, um, we kicked off the job around this time here. And you can see it generated all of these jobs as part of the workflow here. Okay, so uh, let's go back now and uh, see our, uh, so we're definitely done. It took about 30 seconds or so. So let's go ahead now and we're going to validate um, our data on our test data. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, here we go. So you can see here that we did that pretty fast. It actually only took about uh, five milliseconds to do the uh, validation. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, it, uh, now we uh, are going to go ahead and look at our results here. All right. So we go ahead and see. This is actually uh, breaks down our prediction here um, by our values. We can go ahead and, and take a look at um, our output here. Here's our prediction. Now let's go ahead and uh, evaluate well, how we did. OK, so we got 63 right and 13 wrong. So it's good, of course, that we got more right than wrong. Let's also look at some of our other uh, metrics that we have here. All right, so our area under the precision recall curve 
is uh, good. That's actually one. So um, what that indicates is that our uh, we can act uh, that the threshold that we have is um, is uh, uh, you know that our our output is is fairly uh, independent of the threshold that we set. The recall, the precision, and the accuracy in this case are all very close. Um, so what that indicates is, remember we were concerned about class balance before. Um, and I told you that we should look at the precision because the precision is going to deal with the positive cases, that is those who actually have the condition. But in this case, our precision and accuracy and recall are all pretty similar. So what that indicates is that our model is about equally good at predicting those who have the condition as those who don't have the condition. And overall, we're, our accuracy is around 80 to 83%. So that's, oh, you know, not bad. You know, I guess we, you know, again, it, that we can take this as a baseline. We'll talk in, at the end here of our lab about how we can tweak that. Um, so let's also look at the um, confusion matrix here. So we go ahead and see this right here is our uh, um, our true negatives here. These are the true positives. So that worked out well. Uh, let's also look at a visual representation of that. We don't want to see a lot of samples in these cells. This is where we want to see them. So overall, you know, it seemed okay. Um, you know, again, uh, uh, so what we can do if we want to adjust this is we can, um, look at uh, uh, experimenting here, we can increase the number of hidden layers. So if we had two, by going maybe three, four, five, we might be able to uh, achieve better performance. You know, we also can adjust the number of neurons in each. In this case, we used um, 128 neurons, but we could adjust that. Um, so we can also see what features are going to do here. In this case, we chose a subset of our features that may have not been the best of our subset. So what we can do is we can go ahead and check that and see what we have. Okay, so let's talk about takeaways. So we saw how we were able to integrate um, uh, Spark ML Lib together with, uh, with Analytics Zoo. And that brings deep learning capabilities to our Apache Spark ML Lib pipelines. So, that's all I had for you. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please uh, stay tuned and check out um, other uh, uh, tutorial videos that we have related to Analytics Zoo. Thanks and bye.